Hello and welcome to The Modern Consultant. I'm your host, Mark Ahrens, and on today's episode, I have the pleasure of hosting Nathan Hirsch. Nathan is a lifelong entrepreneur who focuses on the unsexy parts of business, and he's also best known for FreeUp.net, where he put $5,000 in to start that business and then, in the space of just a few short years, grew it to be $12 million in annual recurring revenue. Then he exits that business and has plans to travel around the world, and then boom, the pandemic hits. Now he's inside with the rest of us, and he's trying to figure out what to do next. So from there, he starts Ecom Balance, Accounts Balance, as well as Outsource School to help entrepreneurs get through those unsexy parts of business, like hiring and bookkeeping. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about the growth challenges that he sees consultants going through as well as service providers in general. There's lots for us to unpack. We also get into fun stuff like favorite coffee and we also get to talk about some other things like how to manage your energy so that you can stay productive uh, as well. This is going to be a fun episode. So many life lessons to be learned from this one. Look forward to having you on the other side. I'll see you there. Nathan, I just want to say thank you for coming on the show. Uh, it is an honor. This is going to be a blast. I personally have a lot of questions uh, for you. And just based on the last time that we got to talk, uh, there is so much because you have this amazing ability to be able to communicate clearly and in what I describe as a high density way, which our people love. Um, <laughs> very much like uh, background in science, technology, engineering, math, like that sort of thing, very systems oriented people as well. Uh, so it's going to be a fun time. And to kick things off, they would have heard the amazing intro. And I know one of the biggest questions that they have in their mind is the story of going from a $5,000 investment to 1 million and then from the 1 million to 12 million per year. How do we get there? <laughs> yeah. So to kind of paint the picture, I had this Amazon business that I, I had success with with my business partner, but it was a lot of just great timing. We started in 2008. Amazon was bursting onto the scene. No one knew what Amazon was. This was before the courses, the gurus, the software. Um, and we had this very successful Amazon business, but we didn't really have anything sellable, anything that was, was going to survive the next 20 years. And we knew that it was kind of a, a great cash cow at the time. And we were making more money than than any college kid should. But we had this idea for free up. We had all these VAs and freelancers that we were using for our Amazon business. Uh, we started hiring VAs because college kids were, were not reliable, which is a whole other story. Um, but we, we kind of had the, this uh, amount of really good talent. And we started connecting and networking with other e-commerce sellers. And this was a new thing. Like there's a hundred e-commerce seller conferences now that didn't exist back then. People were just starting to network as sellers and we started connecting with them and they kind of had the same issue hiring. They were making hires and hiring was hard. And a lot of the people they hired didn't know e-commerce really well. So we kind of saw a niche in the market where, Hey, we're, we're not going to compete with Upwork and Fiverr because they're public, but we can kind of carve out this niche of really high level e-commerce virtual assistants and freelancers and do something that those people couldn't do and just connect people quickly. So instead of posting a job and getting people to apply and interviewing them, people would just at the beginning before our software would Skype me or call me or email me saying, hey, I need a customer service rep, I need whatever, and we would just match them up. So that was kind of the MVP and, and that took off a little bit. And we did a few things really well. And keep in mind, we're learning marketing and B2B for the first time. Like this is our first experience building a website, SEO, all yeah. the stuff that, that goes with it. So first of all, we started a referral program. We said, hey, you get 50 cents for every hour that we build with someone that you bill for, that comes to us from you forever. And that kind of exploded. And I remember my first call, I still remember it to this day, from someone being like, hey, I was at a conference in China and someone mentioned free up. And so now I want to sign up and use your service. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I've never been to China. Like, this is so cool. Like, people are talking about me in another country. So mm -hmm. the affiliate program is good because we took really good care of our initial clients. They liked the service. It was unique. And they started to tell all the other e-commerce sellers that were bursting onto the scene. The next one was podcasts. The first mm -hmm. podcast I went on, the person forgot to click the record button. Kind of thing was lost. I, I was super pumped when it was done and it amounted to nothing. But mm -hmm. in my mind, I was like, 
well, that was kind of cool. Like I get to public speak a little bit. Um, I get to potentially get in front of a lot of people at once. I got to network with the host and build my first like influencer relationship, which was cool. And, and so I started just asking people to go on their podcasts. And back then there weren't even that many podcasts. And somehow I got on Entrepreneur on Fire, which was nice. um, when, in the early days before, I think now you have to pay to go on. I did not mm -hmm. pay to go on. Um, so it was like early, early days. And, and that really helped accelerate growth too. Then my business partner and I, we sat down and we said, hey, why don't we try to partner with everyone in the space that doesn't do virtual assistant? So there's all these e-commerce software companies, Helium 10, Jungle Scout, uh, whatever, and they don't provide BAs. We don't provide e-commerce software, um, but we both target the same people. So we started doing blog swaps with them and promoting them to our clients and they would promote us to their clients. And that was a quick way to grow. And that turned into going after influencers. We made a relationship with this guy, Ben Cummings, one of the nicest people in yep. the e-commerce. Miller. Know yep. him? Um, yeah, he's great. And I owe Ben a lot. He essentially, I, I got introduced to him from a client and he said, Nate, can you actually handle all these clients I'm going to send you? Because I'm going to send you a ton of clients. And at the time I was like, whoa, like let, let's do this. Um, I did a little webinar for his community and I gave people my calendar. And I swear for the next two weeks, all I did for eight hours a day was take phone calls from his referrals and from his community. Mm. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm not letting Ben down. This is the best opportunity we've ever gotten. I'm going to talk to every single one of them, make sure they're taken care of, make sure Ben gets uh, affiliate money, whatever. Um, and that really took us off. So it was kind of a combination of those things really kind of drove the momentum in year one. Okay, so that is extremely rich context, and this is what I came here for. That was fantastic. Uh, and so digging a little bit into uh, channel sources, uh, you were sharing a number of different strategies that you were testing. And my question is, were any of them failing? Were you seeing some levels of success with each of them? Were you stacking them? Or did you like test one, then move on to the next one, all happening in parallel? Could you break that down? Yeah, great question. So um, we're a big fan of it low, what I consider low risk, high reward situation. So going on a podcast, pretty low risk. If no one listens to it, I'm not losing any money. I lose a little bit of time. If you're a young entrepreneur, you got to sacrifice your time here and there and high, high reward. You get in front of thousands of people, you land those great clients, whatever. So we did try a lot of different things and there were things that didn't work. Like for, for a while, we tried uh, lead generation in a bunch of different ways. We did it on LinkedIn. I did it on Craigslist. Um, I did, we did it on a bunch of places. And it's funny, like I landed a really good client on Craigslist in like the first week we started free up. And that person was with us for four years. And I don't think I landed another client for the next four years. And it wasn't for lack of effort via Craigslist. So there were certain things that just didn't work and you kind of pull back on them and then you double down on others. But I'm a big proponent of like small, consistent efforts. Like mm. if I go on one podcast every day, this one's an hour, but a lot of them are 15, 20 minutes. Like it doesn't seem like a lot, but at the end of the month, you've been in a lot of places and your name's starting to get around. It's good for backlinks. It's good for SEO. And it slowly builds over time. Um, very similar for, for outreach. Like I would have a VA every morning, send me five blogs to reach out to you, five podcasts to pitch, five influencers, five potential partners, five potential clients. And in the first 20 minutes of the day, it doesn't take me very long to do some real authentic, nice, non-pushy outreach, but you've accomplished more than most entrepreneurs do in a week when it comes to outreach. And and that piles on. And and then that follow-up is so key. Like there were podcasts that um, I didn't get on and I, I followed up like every six months for three years before they let me on. Wow. And I was always nice and respectful and I understand they're busy and I'm a nobody and I get all of that. But hey, here's a client that listens to your podcast that uses my service that has a testimonial or mm. hey here's another partner that you know in the space that trusts me and that uses me um could, what about now and th that consistent follow-up there so it's kind of you're trying different things but you're also doing small things every single day mm. pitching five podcasts doesn't take very long low risk high reward and you kind of stack it at, at, uh, over time and you are doing it all together although we didn't just wake up one day and say hey partnerships podcast lead down you start you slowly start to add stuff okay so that is very very helpful context it sounds like there is a mix of earned media organic as well a little bit of uh potentially seo and then also joint venture partnerships the podcast everything that you mentioned there was there any paid uh media any facebook ads google anything like that 
No, and I'll, I'll add it like the same organic marketing blueprint we use. Well, first of all, we teach it at outsource school, like how they do it with VAs, but we also use it for outsource school to get customers there. We use it for e com balance and accounts balance, our monthly bookkeeping service. Uh, we implement it in all our companies. So, free up to, without getting too much into this, very tough business to run ads to for the only reason being that it, it's, it's tough to measure ROI on it because it's free to sign up. And if someone might sign up and hire a VA full-time from day one, they might hire a freelancer for a week and then stop for a month and then go back. They might hire people part-time, project-based. So it's tough to measure churn, which is very tough to measure to like an ROI on, on ad costs. Not impossible. And the new owners that bought it did a way better job than us. Um, but that was definitely a difficult thing for us to figure out. But we also didn't feel like we necessarily needed it at least the first three plus years because we were growing so rapidly. Okay. So that makes sense. So you get up to the one mil uh, in annual recurring revenue and then the journey from one mil to 12 mil, it sounded like at that point, the uh, customer acquisition channels are uh, dialed in and it's probably, I'm guessing more of a systems and team build out. Is that a fair assumption? Definitely. I mean, we had to promote team leaders. We had to build a marketing team and we were doing the same stuff. I mean, it, it kind of builds on it. So like the podcast I was getting on year one, were not as good as the one for year two or year three. And we were getting in with bigger and bigger communities. And the other cool thing that happened is we, we were kind of on the, when e-commerce was starting to boom. So the partnerships that we made in year one, those companies were crushing it. Some of them even became bigger than free up and they had massive audiences and we already knew the founders we were in with them and they trusted us and they were promoting us to, to their following as well. So all that stuff kind of compounds and relationships became a big part of it. Like I went to conferences and met other people in the space and my, my big mentality in life, but, but also business is when you mess up, you just make it right. Like mm. even if you lose money, even if you lose time, like whatever it takes, it's not worth a bad review. It's not worth hurting your reputation. It's not worth having someone resent you. So nothing goes perfect. Although I think most of our customers were very happy, but if a VA messed up, freelancer messed up, what do we have to do to make it right? Do you want credit towards someone else? Do you want a refund? Do you want us to cover replacement costs? So people knew that even if things didn't go right, they could trust us and, and they were confident enough to refer us to other people. And I think that was a, a big underrated part of it as well. That's interesting. Okay. So you get up to the, you know, 12 mil, you know, in annual recurring revenue uh, 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 level, did you know from earlier on that your eventual goal was to exit? No. So okay. I, I think we we kind of, we built the business to be sellable in the way that our systems and processes were good and our team was really good. And Connor and I weren't, were out of the operations for the most part. We would attend meetings and stuff, but like customer service would run without us. Like sales would, we'd have a salespeople. So all that was great. And we, we knew that we had this very profitable business that could be interesting to other people. And so it was on our mind and we had random conversations here and there that never really amounted to anything um, until one day, one of our clients reached out, Mark Hargrove, and their message to us was pretty simple. Um, we we like the VA freelancer space. We like free up. We use free up. We don't start businesses. We buy businesses. Would you guys be interested in, in being acquired? And we, we kind of treated it like any other business opportunity. We'd hear them out and, and answer questions. And we're always kind of upfront and honest with everything good and bad with our, our companies, even if someone's not buying it. And, and so we answered a lot of their questions and they ended up making us an offer. Um, from there, it was it was a tough decision. We, we liked free up. It was making us money. Um, it, had, it was definitely turning into a great like remote lifestyle. We love just having big remote businesses and um, we, it was a lot of factors. I mean, first of all, the offer was good, life-changing money um, that would allow us to do whatever we want going forward. Um, taking care of, care of our team was a big part of it. We wanted to take $500,000 from the sale and give it to our team in the Philippines. And the deal would allow us to, to comfortably do that. Um, the econ This is pre-COVID. So the economy was at an all-time high, which in our mind, like it might not always be the case. Who knows? Like things could happen there. And um, we had never grown a business to... 25 million or 30 million. So there would have been structural changes we would have had to make and maybe we would have mm. figured it out, but it's also possible we could have fallen on our face and entrepreneurship's hard and, and everything that kind of goes with that. So it's kind of like, do we take the money off the table or, or do we keep risking knowing that now, hey, we got a pretty big team and if we go under and our Amazon business did go under, um, so we kind of been there before, is that really the risk we want to take? So mm. 
all that kind of took into consideration. We ended up accepting the deal six months later, and it was the most six months, the most stressful six months of my life. Uh, we signed yeah. to the dot line and um, we couldn't have sold it to better people. It couldn't have worked out better. Uh, they took good care of our team, free up still running. They paid us every penny. They honored all of our agreements and it, it all worked out. But mm. it definitely wasn't the plan going into 2019. I'm curious then as a follow-up question, this now takes us into, you know, the era of accounts balance, um, uh, econ balance and outsource uh, school. Uh, what was the motivation for starting those properties? Sure. So again, kind of putting into context, we sold it in November 2019. Um, and the original plan was to take a year or two off. I didn't think I would see my business partner um, and we would just travel the world. And and then COVID hit like a few months later. So we were in a very weird position where a good position, we're very fortunate, but still weird that we had sold the company. We had no, no business to run because we were out of there within a few months. Um, and we had no business ideas. We had nothing to, to really do or work on it. And we could only watch Netflix for so long and we were going crazy like the rest of the world. So um, a buddy of mine kind of gave us the idea for outsource school, which seemed like low hanging fruit. Um, while we thought of other ideas, we could build a course and launch it. And again, minimum viable product, which I'm a big fan of. If people hated it, we just refund everyone and move on to something else. And if people liked it, we can build on to it and turn it into a community. And mm. luckily people liked it and it's turned into a nice passive income stream. And we added all our SOPs to it and outsource school has, has been pretty awesome for us. Um, but we definitely had that itch to do something out of the VA freelancer space. And I think we learned a lot just about B2B and we wanted to apply it to something different. And we spent the next year and a half like living a pretty chill lifestyle. I moved to Colorado. I bought a house. I became foster parents or my wife and I became foster parents. Um, we got pets and our family moved out here. So life's pretty good, but we're constantly just brainstorming business ideas. And mm. we got a lot of bad ones in there, countless bad ones. And I think for us, we know what we'd like. We like unsexy businesses. We're not trying to create the next Uber. We want to take, we want to find a market that's already big. We don't want to create a market and bookkeeping. Um, it, it definitely falls in that category. Every entrepreneur needs to hire just like every entrepreneur needs to do bookkeeping. And it, it definitely checks other boxes too, like stickiness and reoccurring revenue. And, um, people in the space aren't necessarily great at scaling and hiring and SEO and marketing and all the stuff that on paper, we're good at, we still have to execute it, but on paper, it, it seems like there's a fit. And so we did a lot of market research. We interviewed a hundred different entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. asked them about their bookkeeping service, competitors, what they like, what they don't like. Uh, we published all this to our blog. If anyone wants to check it out, ecombalance.com um, slash blog. And we saw an opportunity and again, minimal viable product. We're not bookkeepers, we're not CPA. So we should probably hire a bookkeeper. We we hired a controller and, and got some clients that we gave some two free months of of bookkeeping too. And, and the rest is kind of history. So it, it seems quick, but it was definitely a, a slow and drawn out process in, in our mind. It's really cool to hear uh, your decision-making uh, uh, criteria uh, for the kinds of businesses that you're thinking about starting. Also where you felt like your sweet spot was. Uh, for the listeners, um, I know we have like three kinds of people who are listening to this right now. And many of them are service providers. They're delivering online, they're selling online. And one of the questions I can hear them asking is, why not just stay strictly the service route? Why productize with outsource school, uh, which for anyone that's unfamiliar is a course? Uh, so well, yeah, that's a good question. And honestly, we went back and forth. I think, how do I phrase this? I think Connor and I looked down maybe on people that had courses in the past, not from like a personal standpoint, just in terms of like, we never took any courses. Like we're weird. We never attended a mastermind. We never hired a coach. We never took any courses. Like we're big proponents of just figuring it out ourselves. And we do a lot of research. We do a lot of like learning online, but courses are never a thing. So in our mind, we didn't know if people would like, like it, hate it, whatever. And like, we didn't really have anything to do. So we were filming this course a little bit each week and put it all together. And we were proud of it and we launched it. And the reviews were, were just great when we launched it. So then we kind of turned it into a little membership because we thought that would be more fun and more fulfilling than just selling a, a one-off course and saying, oh, there's a material like see you. So it kind of slowly developed over time. And I think, I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure we would do that again. I think we do prefer the service-based business more. And I think 
it's a little bit more sustainable. And I, I don't think like outsource school is going to become the next free up where like accounts balance and, and econ balance definitely has more of that potential, which we like. But I think our long term goal is to build a portfolio of mm. different businesses of all different types. And hopefully bookkeeping is around for the next 30 years, which you think it will be. So accounts balance and econ balance are kind of the core portfolio and outsource school is there. And who knows, maybe we do launch other courses, but then we also have other service-based businesses that have nothing to do with hiring and bookkeeping. That's kind of the, the long-term goal. And it's a little bit of testing and a little bit of trying new things. And there's only one way to find out if you like or hate something, and that's to actually do it. I mean, hidden within the answer uh, to your question, it sounded like there was a part of you and perhaps Connor as well that was interested in doing more good uh, in the world. You know, it, it, it's, and I could be, I could be projecting onto this, but when you share the part about, you know, okay, we want to put this out there and we were getting good reviews, it sounded like that might've been a part of it, but I'm also wondering, could you, if you had to describe, um, core motivators for, um, building businesses right now, including outsource school, what would you say they are? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there there's kind of a there's a lifestyle component. Like I like building remote businesses that allow me to do whatever I want whenever I want. And that's kind of the the rebel quality that I think's just been in me since I was a kid. I don't like having mm -hmm. a boss and there, I don't ever want to get a real job. And there's also a part of I think every entrepreneur that's scared scared that you'll fail and have to get a real job in the future. So I think that's partly motivated. Um I also want something that allows me to uh live a life. So like I mentioned we're foster parents, so giving yeah. back to like I'm very, very fortunate. Like I didn't grow up rich. My parents were both teachers, but I had two loving parents that put food on the table that supported me at what I did. And like that alone, a lot of kids don't have. So the ability to kind of give back in that is is super important. Um, and also be able to to help people and and the team. Like we try to pay our team well. I mentioned the money we gave after the free up sale. Um, we want to provide jobs. We want to provide opportunities and outsource school, econ balance, accounts balance employs a good amount of people. And so that's definitely motivating as well. And Connor and I also had a situation with our Amazon business where we had a lot of people and we had to let them go. And um, and that wasn't that much fun. And that was devastating. And people were very upset. So we've kind of been through the ups and downs. And that's motivating as well that, hey, if we're going to have people invest their time and their energy and their motivation to something, we got to build something good that's sustainable, that helps not only us, not only our clients, but, but also our, our team as well. So I think it's a combination of those things. This is, it's a great answer. And now if we were to look forward uh, into the future, could you see yourself uh, doing similar to what you did with FreeUp, uh, exiting these businesses? <laughs> it's so funny because people are like, oh, like you you have this history of selling companies. And so you're just going to flip econ balance and accounts balance. And my response to that is I sold one company. So I don't know if that if that means I have a history of it. Mm -hmm. Um. Like I, I honestly look at econ balance and accounts balance as a great core business of our portfolio. I think bookkeeping is going to be around for a while. I don't see a need to, to sell it. Like if you gave me a million dollars right now, my lifestyle wouldn't change more than it, like very little. And I would even argue if you gave me 5 million or 10 million, my lifestyle wouldn't drastically change that much. So hmm. it would have to be a great offer. Um, but the goal is to build a portfolio of companies that we can kind of keep forever. And looking at mentors, the uh, Mark Hargrove and David Martin, um, the people that bought us, they pretty much just buy and hold companies. <laughs> they don't mm. resell anything. They, they just buy them and hold them. And we kind of look up to that. And free up was a great opportunity to put some cash in the bank and give us flexibility and less stress going forward. But we'd love to, to keep building and holding companies, assuming that we can get out of them. And, and it also kind of supports the lifestyle that we want. If okay, I get so out of them, I like get out of the operations. Absolutely. And so what is striking me as remarkable um, about you and Connor is your ability to figure things out, uh, which is why I think like probably going to be really great instructors instead of like outsource school and anything that you decide to teach. What are some of the common challenges that you've seen entrepreneurs that you've tried to help have? that to you might seem like second nature, but you're noticing other people are having sticking points with it. It's so, so I think one thing that kind of helped Connor and I 
It, the first thing I'll say is it's very easy to be business partners with someone when things are going well. When you're making a lot of money, when you're having success, that's easy. You figure out whether you can work with someone when things aren't going well. And Connor and I had a good amount of like shit hit the fan moments early on mm. that we kind of battled through and, and overcame. And one of the ones that I think is relatable, this actually before Connor, but we've had plenty together. But one of them that I think is relatable that I see all the time um, when I was first making money with the Amazon business and I was doing everything myself and, and it was really exciting and new, my parents told me I should pay taxes. So I met with an accountant and the first thing he asked me is when are you going to hire your first person? And I said, why would I do that? That's money out of my pocket. They're going to steal my ideas. They're going to hurt my business. I can do this seven days a week forever. I love this business. Typical excuses that I hear every day from entrepreneurs on why they're not delegating and this, uh, this accountant just laughed in my face and said, you're going to learn this lesson on your own. Well, sure enough, my first busy season rolls around, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, no idea what to expect. And I just get destroyed. I'm selling mm. baby products and toys during the craziest time, doing everything myself. I'm working 20 hours a day. My social life plummets. My grades go down. And I'm a hard worker. I, I work nonstop for six to eight weeks, got through to January and said, man, I can never let that happen again. I need to hire people. And that's when I hired Connor as my first employee shortly after that. And he was great. Other college kids I hired, not so great. Um, but I think that's the lesson that most entrepreneurs go through. Like you, you, you always delegate too late. You always think you can do it yourself. You always run yourself to that burnout when the real answer is to learn how to hire up front. And that's going to solve so many of your problems. What was the tipping point for you? Like, I, I know you shared okay, you were working, you know, six days a week and you were like, you know, what it sounds like working basically every waking hour that, you know, you could dedicate to the business and that you seem to be pushing forward on it. But at what point was there a particular moment that happened where you're like, okay, no more? <laughs> I, it, it, it's tough because you got to remember at the time I was an actual, I was a broke college kid paying for my college. And so on one side, I'm making more money than I could ever imagine as a 20 year old. On the other side, I have no life and all I'm doing is fulfilling Amazon orders all day. So yep. I, I, to put it in perspective, like I, I thought I was super fortunate that I had this opportunity that the other college kids weren't having. At the same time, it, it wasn't the most fun thing in the world. And I turned down parties and dates and other things that were kind of going on in life to, to kind of focus on this business. And I think I was better for it maybe, but um, yeah, I don't know if there was like a particular day that stood out. Mm -hmm. I was just burnt down, exhausted, nonstop for six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And so this is such a critical point for many of the people who listen into this. Like some of us, you know, deal with burnout, you know, exhaustion, you know, and we do have a very real need to get that help. Um, what are, are there any practices that you have in place now for being able to rejuvenate so you can continue to push forward and pour energy into the business and the vision that you have? Yeah. So, I mean, First of all, I try to not work nights and weekends, and my wife is pretty good at not letting me do that. Um, I think there is a certain element of hustling that you do have to do as an early stage entrepreneur, and there's no way around it. And I think anyone that tells you otherwise is lying. I think there's smarter people than me that disagree with that, but that's my stance. Um, and I, but I think that you have to have like an end game in mind. Like, you, free up was going to go one of two ways: either I was going to hire more operators and make it a lot better for my lifestyle and, and make slightly less money, or I was going to sell it and kind of make sure any business I set up in the future gives me financial freedom or gives me time freedom, hmm. what I meant to say. So um, that's part of it. I'm a big proponent of working out. I will, I do very intense workouts uh, once a day. I'm going to do one after this. Um, it's one hour, high intensity hit, very few breaks. And that's my time to turn off the phone, get away from work, no emails, no Slack. And I kind of have a routine where I do it early afternoon, late morning. Um, to wake up, I like to get stuff done first thing in the morning, take a break, get my work at end, be refreshed, wrap up with some calls, podcasts, be done with the day. And so mm. um, that's kind of a, a been a big part of just being, I think, uh, men, I think it's good for your mental health as much as it is uh, for your, your physical health. So uh, yeah, that's kind of my routine there. I'm a big proponent of like podcasts and audiobooks. I'm always listening to it. Um, I actually try to get away from like business audiobooks and more into like uh -huh. fiction or things that okay. take my anything that takes my mind away from business sometimes gives me better ideas than just focusing on business and education at all times, you know? Nice. Yeah. Huh. 
That is, that leads me to my next question, which is, are you familiar with the uh, Y Combinator and their blog article about maker versus manager schedule? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to look it up. Maybe I have read it. I don't, I can't think of all the time I had. The core concept is basically, you know, uh, Paul Graham, I think was the author of the uh, article, but he basically says that, you know, you have two kinds of uh, people, you know, you have the makers who they're more like Cal Newport, deep work, four hour to eight hour blocks. They're focusing on like just one or two big projects for the day with very little interruptions whatsoever. And then you've got the managers who they manage their day in like 15 minutes, like one hour increments. And it's just like, okay, more people oriented. Uh, do you find yourself gravitating towards one versus the other? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think I've gotten better at blocking off certain days for certain things. Like there are times where like, I do not want to do any podcasts or any phone calls today. And I need to just focus on whatever project this is um, and just block off my calendar. And I have that in my calendar where people can't book out on it. The other thing that I think is very underrated is just brainstorming. Connor, my mm. partner, he'll come over to my house. He lives 10 minutes away. Oh, cool. We'll just <laughs> brainstorm for an afternoon. Like mm. nothing on the calendar, no real agenda. We might have some talking points, but that's it. And we just talk things through and you might leave there with 10 bad ideas and two good ones, but those two good ones are our game changers. And we've, we've been doing that for, for years. So nice. that's part of it. And even just I'll have afternoons where I'll just brainstorm and, and think as well. And I mean, you could be thinking of lots of things from your own life, what you want to do to your personal finances, to business, to decisions that are coming up to hiring, like you name it. And, and that's a big part of it. So I definitely have a balance. I don't think I'm in that like operator anymore. Thank God. So like I have other people that like manage the bookkeepers. So there's less of like me running meetings for my team, but I love like talking to partners and customers and staying involved in the community. Um, I also just talk pretty fast. So my calls end up not being that long, <laughs> nice. um, but yeah, that, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, it does. It does. It does. Uh, it actually leads me to my next question because you mentioned there that you were no longer in the operator role. And so it sounds like, all right, now we're more focused on like owner, CEO, C-suite, vision, so on and so forth. Are there any, uh, management consulting frameworks or company uh, operating system frameworks, if you will, that you use like, you know, entrepreneurial operating system is one that's popular uh, uh, traction, you know, and any others like that, that you use or not really. Yeah. We, I, we Connor and I love those books. I don't, I wouldn't say we implemented exactly and we never hired a consultant to come and implement it. We steal bits and pieces of it. Um, a lot of what we teach at out school is kind of like our custom framework for how we, we do things. And mm -hmm. I, it's, if you looked at it, I don't think it's anything that's like, oh, unique that only Nathan and Connor do It's probably different pieces from different things we've learned or tried that we kind of implement, um, in, and I mean, we're a big proponent of promoting from within and hiring VAs and making them team leaders and having them run meetings. Like we don't attend the bookkeeper meetings outside of one all hands meeting. Like on Monday, we just had ours and it's more of like a fun and putting face in the name and like, Hey, I'm not Nate. I'm not this like big, scary guy that you can never talk to. Like we're here. If you need anything, if there's an issue, we want to know about it, stuff like that. So, um, I don't have a, a framework, but it, it's all around like building a strong team that can manage and that kind of has our core company values, um, in mind. And I'll kind of, I'll give you my five company values. Oh, um, nice. Please. Um, so don't be a hero is the first one. We want people who like speak up for those issues and not go down rabbit holes trying to solve them because a lot of times someone else on the team might have a good answer um, and might be able to help. Obsess over the client experience. I kind of mentioned how big customer service is and anything that we build. So we're always trying to make that better and easier. Over communicate to everyone. Um, we love communication, both the clients in terms of response time and clarity, but also internally. Um, plan and think ahead. We want people on our team that are not just randomly doing stuff. They have a, a real plan to, to get stuff done. And then lastly, be accurate and on time. So mm -hmm. that's to do a lot with like the bookkeeping work. And obviously that's a big part Sense, of the yeah. monthly bookkeeping service. Of course. Yeah. That makes a world of sense. Uh, and thank you for sharing the values. Uh, Cause that, that um, I kind of look at values as like guiding principles for the purposes of being able to make effective decisions and also be able to delegate uh, decision-making onto others. I don't know if you think about it differently. Actually, yeah, that's a great question. How do you think about uh, the use of values within a company? It's huge. <laughs> so I'll give you kind of a creative thing that we we do. Um, we, so we have a $100 challenge 
uh, mm. that people can decide to do if they want to, completely optional. And we just had one this morning that someone won and they, they won a hundred bucks. And it's nice. 10, 10 company questions. The last question is always, what are our five company values and explain them. Um, and essentially we'll, we'll grill them on different things that they should know. It, it could be everything straightforward as pricing to how, what's our response time on client emails. It's always one business day. And so we kind of go through like different, different questions there. And it's a, just kind of a fun way to, to motivate everyone to, to remember things and not have us repeat things a hundred times and, and take ownership of it. Because I think a lot of times in business, you get into the habit of, um, just saying the same thing over and over and it's yep. not sticking and there's no real why behind it, but this makes it a quick and easy why. If you know what we stand for and what the expectations are, you can win money at any point. <laughs> if no one wants to do the hundred dollar challenge. We got $1 questions that will do solo questions and just lots of creative variations off of that mm -hmm. uh, to make it worth it. No, yeah, that's cool. It's like uh, introducing gamification uh, for building company culture. <laughs> that's, <Yeah. laughs> that's 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 really a good thing we tried. That wasn't yeah. like a free upper outsource school thing. That's strictly for econ balance, and it's been going uh, really well. That's super cool. Uh, question: yeah. Philippines. Why hire from the Philippines? And because it seems like you've been very intentional, um, of course, because you will teach hiring and implement a bunch of hiring. Uh, Philippines versus Matt. There's Oh, so many other countries in the world that you could be choosing. So my first tip is if you're hiring for, let's say the first time or you're newer to hiring, hire from one place. You're adding a lot of extra work to your plate. If you hire like one person from India, one person from Philippines, one person from Pakistan, there's different time zones, there's different cultures, there's different communication that you're going to have to learn. And so pick one place. And if you're going to, and you can always add more later. But start with one. And if you're going to hire from one place, Philippines is a great place to start. They speak English at a high level. They're used to working with U.S. clients and U.S. hours. Um, they have a lot of the same culture. They consume a lot of the same media, which makes it easier. Uh, mm -hmm. They're all about family and, and they live with big families. We like to create families within our team, which leads to lower turnover. So all those are kind of um, a few reasons. And if you check out Outsource School, there's a free trial and there's a video in there. Uh, hiring from the Philippines 101. Um, that that's worth checking out. It's all stuff that I wish I knew about hiring from the Philippines that, that I learned uh, just from working with them. Hmm. Okay. So, bouncing back to the energy uh, and focus uh, part of the conversation, you mentioned that you did high intensity interval uh, training, which I think is awesome. Uh, one thing I didn't get to ask you about that though was why middle of the day workout versus morning or like evening time. So don't like working out in the morning. That's more of a personal preference. I think my brain is on like right away when I wake up. Uh, mm -hmm. This is just a Nate thing. And my body is not. <laughs> so I need okay. to kind of, <laughs> kind of wake up. And, and I, I'm very productive. Like that first two hours a day, I think I get more done than anyone else. And mm -hmm. it's also nice because no one else on to like distract me or bother me. Um, and then that, and then by that point, my brain's a little fried. My body's awake and I get a workout in. And I just, and now that I never work out at night, but I found by the end of the day, you're tired and and stuff like stuff happens there. So for me, that like eleven o'clock to one o'clock is like the the perfect time. Mm, coffee, no coffee. Uh, I definitely drink coffee. Although I didn't until I was like twenty eight or something. But huh. um, I drink coffee in the morning. Do you have a favorite kind? <laughs> I, I so me and food. My wife and I are big foodies. We're always about just trying different things all the mm -hmm. time. So we're always just buying different coffee, um, and, and just trying different stuff or. Whatever's on sale, we're both pretty frugal. Like it's, it's not the best answer, but that's just the truth. Okay, two questions. I have a friend of mine flying back from Colombia today. They're bringing back some Colombian coffee for me. However, Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee, have you had it? I don't think so. I actually had Colombian coffee yesterday and it was really bitter for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I, I do like Colombian coffee, but for whatever reason, that one didn't do. Okay, all right. So- Newsflash, I am Jamaican, 100% uh, uh, born and raised. And I'm not saying that, because I got a lot of Colombian friends, I'm not saying Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee is better than Colombian coffee, but all of my Colombian friends that I've shared it with, they say they love it. So I'll just leave it there, you know. <laughs> just, if you want to partake, you know, I, I will follow up with you after <laughs> our podcast interview to see how you liked uh, Jamaican Blue Mountain Coffee, and if it was bitter, and then I will talk trash uh, to my Colombian friends. Uh, I, 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 I,
<laughs> uh, perfect. Uh, there's so many questions that I could continue to ask you, uh, though I know most of the answers are actually going to be inside of uh, econ balance. You know, it's going to be inside of outsource school. But in a couple closing questions to wrap up, because you've done such an amazing job of adding value here today. If you could go back in time to starting econ balance, accounts balance, and also starting outsource school, what advice would you give yourself knowing everything that you know now? You said that's a good question. So, so econ, good question. All right. So outsource school, um, the one part of it that didn't work is we try, we like softwares to be behind our company. So we ended up building an SOP building software uh, called Simply SOP. And I think we kind of went against our own thing, which is like, like capture big markets. Like SOP software is great, but it's not something that every entrepreneur really needs. We ended up selling that back to the developer that built it and it was fine, but it definitely wasted some like time and energy when we could have just focused on like the real content of outsource school that, that people liked. So that that's one thing that I definitely would have changed there is just keep it a membership, keep the course and SOPs inside. Don't worry at all about a software component. Um, and for Econ Balance, we, we didn't really know how to work with bookkeepers for like the first six months. It was a learning curve. They're, they're very unique. Um, they like kind of being in their own zone and like working on numbers all day. Um, and getting getting someone um, who more understands them up front to manage them instead of for the first like six months having Connor and I trying to like sort everything out, that's been a game changer. Like they, they communicate well. We have someone in the Philippines managing the Philippines team. We have a U.S. team too. And it just get us away from the bookkeepers. We'll listen to them. We'll honor feedback. We'll treat them well. Um, but you don't need us involved in like the actual bookkeeping decisions or processes. And hmm. I, I probably would have gotten out of that a lot faster. Communication management makes sense. Uh, cultural contexts across different um, uh, uh, U.S. as well as uh, different countries of Philippines. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I could see that uh, for sure. Uh, anything else that you would have given yourself advice on? Um, that's a good question. Let's see. Yeah, I think the first six months of, of Econ Balance, we probably added clients maybe a little too fast. Now we're at kind of a good pace where we add like five to eight new clients every month. And if it goes above that, we kind of pump the brakes a little bit. And um, it's just not free up as a good business because it could just scale very rapidly. And you're not do you're not really like managing your own team. It's a marketplace. You're connecting people. Um, Econ Balance can grow but it can't just grow rapid fire. Like stuff comes up with bookkeeping. There's stuff that you have to fix and it takes time and steady growth is a lot better than just straightforward or straight up with, with this kind of business. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's all I got there. That's no, uh, it's, 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 all, I always love uh, to ask that question. Cause one, I learned <laughs> a ton uh, just retrospectively. If you had to like go back through and do it again, you know, what would you do? Uh, and where could we find out more about you? Yeah, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, Nathan Hirsch. I put up a lot of content there about hiring and bookkeeping. Uh, check out my business partner, Connor Gillivan, there as well. If you guys love SEO, uh, he's an SEO genius. He posts a lot of great stuff there. Um, and yeah, go to outsourceschool.com. You can grab a free trial there. You can meet with my great virtual assistant, Anna, if you want to see what an A-plus VA looks like. And Econ Balance, if you go there, mention this podcast and you get two months free. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Thanks. Hey. Thanks for checking out the show. If you liked it, go ahead and hit the like button and also subscribe so you don't miss another one. It also tells us which ones that you like the most so that we can then do more interviews like that. If you want to go from idea to implementation though, especially if you're wanting to productize your expertise so that you can scale your impact on your clients and of course grow your business, then join our email list. There we're going to talk about how modern consultants can productize their expertise so that they can have a greater impact on the world around them and live life on their terms. If that's up your alley, I hope to see you on the other side. Talk soon.